All right, a couple of people have asked me to talk about the secessionist movement in the United States, um, although I think that's probably a mis misnaming at this point, uh, uh, especially in regards to these petitions on whitehouse.gov. And to start off, let me say that I think the main story with these petitions on whitehouse.gov is not secession. It's more um, an example of how... Um, the administration and really the government generally um, approaches feedback from that what they would say constituents but really they're those that they aim to rule um, the the first I ever heard about uh, the White House.gov positions and the, for those of you who don't know which I'm assuming it's basically none of you uh, the Obama administration has became elected um, one of the things that they said that they would do would be they'd be the most transparent uh, administration ever. And in every meaningful way, they're not. I mean, they attack whistleblowers ruthlessly. I believe uh, Bush, the Bu Bush administration had a horrible record when it came to uh, whistleblowers. They would um, have have them uh, hit with gag orders by, by or So the most famous example here is Sibel um, Emmons or Edmonds, I forget her last name. Sibel Edmonds, who was a translator of Arabic or Farsi or both, I don't remember. And she tried to blow the whistle, and they she didn't go to jail. She hasn't been executed, but the Bush administration put a gag order on her and said basically, if she says anything about what she knows, then she'll be in trouble. Well, the Obama administration has. Um, just started throwing them in prison and charging them with crimes. Uh, the most famous by far is Bradley Manning, although there have been many dozens or hundreds, I'm not sure, uh, all usually on less dramatic things than what, than what he's charged with. And I think uh, he's, his record is like he's, he's um, imprisoned four times more than Bush ever even gagged. So uh, he's not open at all. The idea that legislation is going to be uh, readable or, you know, in, in a format where people can digest it before they make a decision on whether to vote for it. That's not, not true. But one of the things that came out of this was this whitehouse.gov idea. And the, the point was to uh, anybody, and as far as I can tell, apparently anybody um, can suggest a topic. And if it gets a certain number of signatures, and these signatures um, are pretty easy to get, if it gets a certain number, and I believe the number is 25,000, then that will entitle that petition to have some type of response. Now, right off the bat, that promise of some type of response is extremely vague. Um, basically, they could do almost anything and say that, that plausibly claim to have met that. Um, and... I mean, you'd think that maybe the, the press secretary will, will say something. Now, that's the first I had heard of it. Now, the next I ever heard of this was when medical marijuana became um, a very highly rated one, and I had heard that it was getting to the point where it was nearing enough signatures to draw an official response. Maybe it had already passed it. I don't remember the details. This was several years ago. And just before that, it was taken off, you know, they, they just got rid of it off of the petition so that apparently they, they didn't want to um, make a response and so they just got rid of it. And what that is illustrating is that the point is not to genuinely engage. It's not to uh, actually try and gather you know, democratic osmosis of knowledge to the government. You know, The rhetoric of the Democrats especially is, is that of it's kind of weird, but it's it's like, you know, the common people are channeling their wisdom through us, and, and this would be kind of a way, although there's mixed in there, there's also a smart, educated technocrats know what's best for everybody, and those are mutually exclusive uh, rhetorical stances, and it's one that they, you know, they both, both parties do it, but Democrats do it a little bit more than Republicans. Republicans are a little bit less egalitarian in their rhetoric usually uh, not in their actions but just in their rhetoric and and I think 
what this shows is the the main purpose of, of something like this these this petition site is to give the illusion or the appearance um, or the pretense of giving a shit what people think um, in such a way that it doesn't really have any effect. The Obama administration is not going is not bound by these petitions. How they react is is up to them basically and apparently it's mostly non-reaction and I think that these petitions if anyone takes the time to go read through all of them and I haven't read through all of them but I read for through several pages um, there's clear mockery of the administration there are petitions on there um, actually a friend of mine from college uh, actually petitioned that the city of Toledo be returned to the state of Michigan uh, it used to be a long time ago, and now it's part of Ohio. And then he also was demanding that Ohio be forced to pay ten trillion dollars in damages to uh, the, the state of Michigan uh, for the the hardship that they caused the people of Toledo. Uh, there was another article or petition that a iron throne be created out of meteorites and infused with gems to. Um, basically enthrone a new emperor of the world who I, was not actually Obama, it was somebody else, some uh, comedian I'd never heard of. And it's funny, you get a laugh out of reading it, and clearly the people who are posting them are doing so in jest, as I'm sure at least some of the secession petitions are, although I don't think all of them. And I think this is is a mockery of, of government, and I think what will happen is they will probably just toss them all out and it will also give them a convenient pretext for any serious um, secession ones and just say well look uh, people are just joking around here so uh, you know it's beneath us to respond so I actually think that's the main story behind the petitions on whitehouse.gov however there is also in their secessionist rhetoric overtly secessionist rhetoric and this is an indication of a very small, but I think growing, and I'm not predicting anything here, but it's definitely growing, secessionist sentiment within the United States. Now, on one level, I think, and there's a meme on Facebook that I saw that captures this very well. It's a picture of Robert E. Lee um, rallying a whole bunch of Confederate troops. I, th I don't know. It's a famous painting. I think it's later in the war. Might be right. Uh, I think it might be during the wilderness or maybe the Battle of the Crater. I th so I think it's probably in 1864. And, you know, the, the, it's a very dramatic painting. He's leading the, the soldiers. And then the caption on the bottom says, let's go fill out a petition on whitehouse.gov. The, the implication being pretty clear that if you're really serious about secession, um, beseeching and asking the chief executive to please grant it to you uh, does not make a whole lot of sense. If you have the right to secede, then it's not necessary. And it's very servile to ask that way. Um, and that's a, an obvious critique of this happening. Uh, secession, I think, has a real chance of working in the right context, in the right situation, but asking the, the chief executive to do it, uh, I don't think will ever happen. Um, but if Texas were to just say, well, we're going to secede, I don't know how much the federal government would be willing or able to really do about that. Um, I don't know if we'd have a war like we did in the 1860s. So many circumstances are different now than back then that uh, predicting things that would happen now based on that is probably not going to yield very accurate results. Um, I mean, obviously, we look at. I'm very interested in civil war, but I, I don't know how applicable that that experience would be today. The federal government is completely different. The states are completely different. Society is radically different, more different than the other two. The federal government has changed enormously since then, but it, the government um, changes much slower in a much more retarded way than the rest of society. And so, I mean, basically, all the variables are different at this point. Um, but it's encouraging to me that there are people, and I, again, I don't think, A, the numbers and the petition are representative because lots of people who are for secession are probably not aware of these uh, 
petitions and many who are aware of them will not sign them. And on the other hand, many of the people who sign them are doing so in jest or they're not really serious. Like I'm sure lots of people who sign these petitions, if, if they could actually be given the choice of actually succeeding, many of them would not. Uh, or if they thought that there was going to be a war, an even smaller number of them would. And the result is, I don't think there can be much gauging of how much secessionist sentiment there is, other than in a relative sense from state to state. So Texas, I think, has something, last I heard, close to 100,000 signatures. You know, some of the other states have like 100 or maybe a few thousand. And I think it's safe to say that there's a net more secessionist uh, rhetoric in Texas than say some of those other states although even there Texas is the second most populated state so it's going to have a lot of people in there you know it could have a lower ratio of secessionists than say Utah or New Hampshire but it would still have an absolute more number and a petition potentially so it's really hard to say um, like I said I think the main story here is it's it's showing that the administration is not really interested in getting feedback. Uh, it's interested in giving the impression that it gives a shit without actually having to bother with what people really care or think about. Um, now, the government is not in a vacuum. If enough people care about something enough, then they have to do something. They can't, I mean, they can, but it's at their own peril to ignore major social movements and trends. And sometimes they're stupid enough that they do that, or they're hubristic enough that they'll do that. Um, and in a sense, this session thing is something that, okay, at some point they have to say something. I mean, the media has been talking about it a good deal. It hasn't been top story or anything, but, you know, hey, this is being said. And um, at some point it becomes counterproductive to ignore it. I'm not saying that we've reached that point. I'm just saying that at some point it becomes that way. And... Uh, I think for now the sentiment is pretty weak because the lower what we would need is to have the state governments to become way more ballsy in this respect and they're not likely to become so anytime in the near future because most people in state politics are in one of the two parties and party politics are dominated uh, on the national stage and let's let's just for instance say if you were the a Democrat or a Republican, and for whatever reason you thought that secession or nullification or some kind of states' rights movement was popular in your state and maybe something that you could gain from politically, that would only be at the expense of any national ambitions you might ever have. So if you start screwing Congress, then the RNC or the DNC are not going to help you ever get to become hold federal office. Uh, and so if that's your ambition, which it is the ambition for not all of them, but a huge number, a large portion of the state um, litigator, uh, legislators uh, and politicians, then, I mean, it's a no-go. I mean, <laughs> Rick Perry wanted to run for president. He didn't, I mean, so uh, he didn't succeed. But I don't, I don't think that he could ever expect the, the uh, RNC to support him if he seriously... Um, you know, supported secession, which is probably why he would come out with these statements like, well, we love the Union. So great. Now, I also think it's interesting. Uh, people in the United States make uniquely absurd arguments against secession uh, because when they say things like Texas, there's no way Texas could be its own country because Americans, na nationalists in America think that the only the only viable nation state is one that's like the United States. So if you can't have the same number of people and the same amount of wealth as the United States, then that's inviolable. That's that's the system that can't work. And it's just silly because only two countries have greater populations than the United States. Only two or three, depending on how you measure it, have greater um, land area than the United States. Land area slash resources, although measuring resources is rather problematic. And no country now or ever has had as much wealth as the United States, not even by half. So by that logic, all countries in the world today are not liable. Russia, China, India, UK, they're, they're just all 
um, impractically tiny and poor and can't effectively defend themselves, according to the logic of people who say Texas could never make it as its own country. Every state in the United States is large enough, rich enough, and, and geographically viable enough to be better than uh, most states out there, a majority of states. Certainly the micro states and a lot of failed states. But I mean, even like New Hampshire or Vermont, they're going to have a leg up relative to basically anywhere in Africa except for maybe South Africa. Um, and people say, well, they might not have a large enough army, but New Hampshire is never going to get in a war with Egypt or Algeria. Um, and they're not going to get in a war with Vermont, the rest of the United States, or Canada either. I'm just using them as an example, but there's a certain level of absurdity, an extra level of absurdity, when uh, you know American nationalists uh, dismiss the idea of secession because, uh, I mean, Texas, Texas is what, like the, th the 30th largest economy in the world, something like that. Uh, and you think that they could not defend themselves against Mexico? That's assuming that Mexico would just suddenly attack them. I just, yeah, it's just silly. Um, but we're a long way from this. And I think I heard in the end I was right or somebody else say this. It's exactly right. Yes, there's not a lot coming from this right now, but everything has to start somewhere. And I'm not saying it started here, but this is a, a little baby step on, on the way. I'm not one who thinks that everything has to come from secession or nullification or politics generally, but it's a good sign, even if it's pretty minor. And like I said, I think the main thing here is not to do with secession. It's, it's the hypocrisy of the state, especially the executive branch of the federal government in particular in this case, you know, alleging that they're open and whatever, when they're clearly not. And, and this is just showing that this is... Um, a, an activity on theirs that has no substance really other than to deceive it's the it's the um, veneer the veneer of substance you know it's it's the illusion of defense it's like the aircraft carriers they don't really make us safer but they're big and powerful and you know they make us feel like our taxes are being put to good use so um I think I'm going to make another video actually about the Civil War. I had quite a few people ask me about it. I picked up a whole bunch of subscribers from the UK, and uh, some of them have asked me about it. And I actually recorded a video when I was in Colorado on my other camera, but um, when they get, it was too long. And if I tried to, I don't think I'd be able to upload it on my other camera. So, anyway, that's what I think about the secessionist movement. Um, I will be interested to see what the administration says if they say anything. Oh, I think it's probably most likely that they will um, do nothing, or if they do something, it will be very, very minimal, like uh, we're not responding to this. Our response is to not respond or something like that. So we will see, won't we, Mises?